This summer we're doing a Bible study in uh, the Gospel of Luke. It's the story of Jesus. And uh, today we're in Luke chapter 9. It's page 891 in your Bible. If you want to open up there, page 891, Luke chapter 9. And this is a really interesting section we're going to read because it's actually a series of five very short vignettes, five little short interactions that Jesus has with different people. And uh, the one thing that is in common in all five of them is that the people Jesus is interacting with <laughs> have got things messed up, and uh, Jesus kind of does some straight talk with them. In fact, I'm calling this, you can see at the top of your outline, I'm calling this talk, Jesus on the Straight Talk Express. And uh, if there, anyone here is politically astute, you'll know where I got that title, right? Uh, the late Senator John McCain in his presidential campaigns from 2000 and 2008 uh, named his campaign tour the Straight Talk Express. And I'm shamelessly ripping that off from him. Uh, but in this case, it's Jesus doing the straight talking. He's not running for office. He's headed to Jerusalem to give his life on a cross for all of us. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read each one of these little short pieces. And then I'll make some comments on them. And, uh, and then we're going to pray and go eat ice cream. Sound good? All right, when you came in, you were given a handout. Uh, they mentioned that already. On one side of it, you'll find an outline. Why did we give you that? Uh, because here's a conviction we have. We think that every time we open the Bible that uh, we give God a chance to speak to us. And if God speaks to you today, I'm hoping that you'll take a moment and just write down what he says. Write down that thing he says to you. And uh, you'll say, well, how will I know if it's God speaking to me? And the best answer I can give you is, you'll just know, right? It'll be that thing that kind of jumps out at you. You go, oh, I needed to hear that. Write that down so you remember it, all right? So Lord, speak to us as we open your word today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite the ushers to come. Ushers, would you come? And if you brought an offering to give or your tithe, thank you again for your generosity. Uh, we appreciate so much the fact that your giving makes possible everything that happens here and uh, around our community and around the world, stuff we're doing. All right, so while we're giving, let's dive in. Number one, straight talk about his mission. And we're going to start at verse 43, Luke 9, verse 43. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. All right, so just to set the stage here, uh, uh, last week we talked about the story where Jesus went up on the mountain. He was transfigured in blazing glory. Three of the disciples saw this, experienced this. They come down from the mountain into the valley, where there's a crowd gathered arguing with Jesus' disciples. They were unable to, uh, to heal uh, a boy with epilepsy. And uh, Jesus does that, gives them back to his father. And it says everyone was marveling at the greatness of God and uh, marveling at all that Jesus did. So at this particular moment, right, after Jesus has just healed this boy, uh, it's a pretty good thing to be on Team Jesus, wouldn't you say? Right? I mean, his disciples are feeling pretty good. Like, hey, Jesus is, Jesus is, is he something? And then Jesus kind of, so they're in this euphoria. They're feeling really good. And then Jesus says, listen carefully. I have something I want to tell you. Listen carefully. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Now, in Mark's version, in Matthew's version, it's a little bit more clearly stated. Jesus says there, I'm going to Jerusalem where I'll be crucified, buried, and I'll rise again on the third day. Jesus is giving them some straight talk about his mission. He's come to give his life to redeem the world. He's on his way to Jerusalem. Not to take a throne and become the king, but to go on a cross and give his life to redeem the world. So here's a little bit of background here. Jesus' disciples, by this point, believe that he's the long-awaited Jewish Messiah or the savior of the world. The problem is they misunderstood what that meant. They thought that the Messiah would be a military leader who would come and drive out the Roman oppressors and would make Israel a free nation, a great nation again. In fact, I found an ancient photo of one of these disciples. Um, there he is right there. And uh, can you read what's on his hat? Make Israel great again. And here's what I want to tell you, friends. If there had been hats like that in Jesus' day, his disciples would have been wearing them. True story. 
They would have been wearing that hat, make Israel great again, because that's precisely what they thought Jesus was up to. And so when they saw Jesus doing miracles, when they saw Jesus displaying great power, they were convinced that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to be crowned king, to drive out the Romans and lead a revolution. And Jesus straightens them out here. They're all euphoric, and Jesus says, let me remind you what I'm about. I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not to become king, but to give my life on a cross. It says they didn't understand, and they were afraid to ask. I'm just curious, anybody here ever been uh, afraid to ask? Let me just remind you, when you were teenagers, and you wanted to do something, and you didn't think your folks would give you permission. You didn't want to ask. You were afraid to ask because you were afraid they would say what? They would say no, and you figured out it's just easier to get forgiveness than permission, right? So you just did it. (laughs) Makes me wonder, makes me wonder how much of what God's up to in the world I miss because I'm afraid to ask. I'm afraid of what God might say. Jesus' mission was to give his life to save us from death and to bring us back to God. He came to seek and to save the lost, he said. But to save us, and this is kind of the curious part, to save us, He had to die. And that raises what I hope would be this question in your mind. Why? Why did Jesus have to die? What's going on there? Well, the Bible says that God made you for himself. He made you for a relationship with himself. But every one of us, every single one of us, have abandoned God, rebelled against God, and gone our own way. And the Bible has a word for this. What's the the word the Bible uses to describe this? It's sin, thank you, that's sin. And all of us are sinners, and the Bible says the penalty for that sin, the penalty for that rebellion is death. And really, friends, all it is is God himself is the source of life. When we abandon him and run away from him, we abandon life, which means we're automatically choosing death, exactly. The penalty for sin is death. And Jesus came to pay that penalty, to take our place, to die in our place and bring us back to God. Let me just picture it for you this way. Imagine that when we're done today, you get in your car, You drive through downtown, you go speeding through downtown, hit a pedestrian, and kill him. You're arrested, you're taken to court, and there, after all the evidence is presented, you're found guilty of speeding, of negligent driving, and of vehicular manslaughter. The judge wraps the gavel, he pronounces you guilty, he sentences you to 10 years in jail. Now, you don't want to go to jail for 10 years. But then you're surprised when the judge says, justice has to be served but I also love you, and because I love you, I'm going to do your time. I'm going to go to jail in your place, and you can go free. And then you look up and you notice that the judge is your father. And this is what Jesus did, friends. Jesus came and did our time. Jesus came and took our place. This is why he had to go to a cross. And this is what none of the disciples understood. And this is what Jesus is telling them in this particular point. When the disciples were amazed at the greatness of Jesus, when they were all excited thinking maybe he's going to go to Jerusalem and beat up the Romans, Jesus brings them back down to earth with some straight talk about his mission. I'm going to die, he said. Number two, straight talk about greatness. Verses 46 to 48. Verse 46, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. And then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Well, this is a recurring argument among Jesus' disciples. That happens over and over again. Who's the greatest among us? I wonder if this particular argument was started because Jesus had only taken three of them up on the mountain. And I wonder if the other nine were looking at that with a little bit of jealousy, right? Like, who do you guys think you are? Why do you get to go with Jesus? Or maybe, again, because they're on their way to Jerusalem, maybe the argument started because they're all lobbying for the top spots in Jesus' cabinet. They believe he's going to go be the king, and uh, they want to be the vice president's. But it's stunning to me, it's stunning that immediately after Jesus announces that his mission is to go and die, they start arguing about who's the greatest. Does anyone else find that particularly dense? Jesus knows what they're thinking and stands a little child next to him. And he says, whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me. Notice, would you, that 
little children were near Jesus. There were kids close enough to Jesus that he could reach out and grab one and use that child as an example. Why is that important? Well, because children in ancient societies were not treated with the same value that we're used to in our culture. Kids had no social standing. They had no value until they were old enough to work and make a contribution to the family. They were literally the least among you. And so Jesus stands a little child, the least next to him, and he says that when we welcome or receive the least among us, that we're welcoming or receiving Jesus. By the way, this isn't the only time that we find Jesus hanging out with kids. If you'll put your marker there in your Bible, in uh, Luke 9, where we are, and turn over to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, page 868. Mark 10, page 868. We're going to begin at verse 13. You'll see there the heading. It says, the little children and Jesus. And it says, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. Who was he indignant with? The disciples, right. He was, he was upset with the disciples. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and he placed his hands on them and he blessed them. Isn't it fascinating that Jesus had time for children and his disciples didn't? His disciples scolded the parents and told, they tried to shoo them away. Why? Well, very simply because they thought that Jesus was a VIP, which was true, but they also thought that children were nobodies. And they didn't think it was appropriate for the parents to be bringing these kids that didn't matter to Jesus, who again is so important. And Jesus was indignant and corrected them, let the little children come, and they did. And Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them. In other words, Jesus used his valuable time to love the people who were the least, the people who considered, were considered to have no value. So Jesus' point here is that real greatness is measured in how you treat the least of these. And when we watch the life of Jesus, when we read the life of Jesus, we see that he's constantly serving the marginalized, that Jesus is moving toward people that others ignored or rejected. Jesus was never too busy, nor considered himself too important for children. Nor was he too busy to stop and heal a blind beggar that everyone else overlooked. Nor was he too busy to touch a leper that no one else would touch. Nor was Jesus too busy to reach out to a tax collector that everyone else hated. Jesus constantly moved toward the marginalized. So greatness in the mind of Jesus, greatness is not about having a title or power or position. Greatness is about serving the least. Greatness is about moving toward the small, the insignificant, the powerless, the least of these. When the disciples were arguing about which of them was the greatest, Jesus gave them some straight talk on greatness. Greatness, he said, is about serving the least of these. Number three, doing all right? Okay. Number three, straight talk about tribalism. Verse 49 and 50, a little short story here. Verse 49, back to Luke 9, verse 49. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. Don't stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. This is a fascinating little story. Here's a guy who's doing good in Jesus' name. In other words, he's going out uh, in, the, in the authority and uh, the power of Jesus and helping to set people free. And John wants to stop him. Why? Because he's what? He's not one of us, John said. He's not one of us. All right. And by the way, if he's not one of us, he must be one of them. Ooh. Is this a problem in the Christian world, friends? Oh, my word. Yeah, I'm calling this tribalism. Now, here's the thing. All of us, as human beings, all of us organize in tribes or groups. It's just human nature. Nothing wrong with it. And we organize into all kinds of tribes, into cities, into nations, into families, into schools, into unions, teams, clubs, even churches. Right? 
We just do this naturally. So it's no surprise, it's really no surprise that Jesus' followers have tribes too. So we're part of a denomination here. Our denomination is called Foursquare. That's our tribe. And uh, here's the thing about denominations. Every denomination is marked by certain doctrinal distinctives. So here's the thing. As Christians, we share this great common center of our faith. It's all about Jesus. And uh, every Christian that I know shares that center. So what is it that makes us different from each other? Well, it's secondary things, little secondary things that we say, well, we believe this, you know, you believe that. And so we emphasize that. But the problem is we overemphasize those distinctives to make our tribe clear. Here's, here's the boundaries of our tribe. We believe this. This is why I say that denominations are simply groups of people who've all agreed to be wrong about the same things. So there's, there's tribes. By the way, I love our tribe. It's a great tribe. Individual churches are tribes too. Most of you in the room today are part of this tribe, Life Center. I love our tribe. This is a good tribe, isn't it? It's a good tribe. And nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with being part of a tribe, nothing wrong with loving your tribe. I love our church. But it becomes a problem when it becomes us and them. It becomes a problem when I start disliking other churches or opposing them, or bad-mouthing them. It becomes a problem when it becomes a competition, when it's us versus them, when we're divided and suspicious and fighting each other. And when that happens, friends, I think Jesus' heart is broken. So here's the deal. I'll just be real clear about this. Uh, everyone who loves Jesus is part of the Jesus tribe, Team Jesus, if you will. And so we like to say it this way, and we say it a lot around here. We say, if you're for Jesus, we're for you. If you're for Jesus, we're for you. Would you say that with me? If you're for Jesus, we're for you. Whatever your tribe is, Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostal, Catholic, Orthodox, Baptist, Independent, if you're for Jesus, we're for you. It doesn't mean we have to agree about every little point of doctrine. It doesn't mean that we have to do everything together. But if you're for Jesus, we're for you. We want you to succeed. There's never a reason to be jealous of another church's success because we're all part of Team Jesus and if they win, we win, right? That's important to remember. So we're not going to oppose someone who's serving others in Jesus' name, even though they may not do it exactly the way we would do it, even though they're not part of our group. If you're for Jesus, we're for you. So Jesus says this to him. He says, don't stop this man. For anyone who's not against you is for you. If you're for Jesus, we're for you. So friends, uh, I love our church. I love our church. But I also respect the other churches in our town, and we are for them. We're not trying to compete with them. We are rooting for them. We're cheering them on. We're helping them. We're working together with them to accomplish Jesus' purposes in our community. By the way, it's one of the most fun parts of my job is uh, that during the week, I get to meet with pastors of all different tribes and stripes all across our community, and God is doing some remarkable things in bringing people together and helping us understand that we really are one big tribe, the Jesus tribe. So love your tribe, whatever it is, but be for anyone who's for Jesus. When the disciples were taking sides, when they were opposing those who were not part of their group, Jesus gave them some straight talk about tribalism, and he says, look, let's just be for everyone who's on Team Jesus. Number four, straight talk about opposition. Okay, before I dive into this quick poll, how many of you in the room are currently facing some opposition from someone? Someone is giving you trouble. Someone's opposing, okay? Got some of you, okay? Bunch of you. Let's see what Jesus does with this. Luke chapter nine, verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and then he and his disciples went to another village. All right, so here's Jesus resolutely setting out for Jerusalem. And by the way, this is the turning point in the Gospel of Luke. From here on out, the rest of the story is about Jesus' journey to Jerusalem where he's going to give his life for all of us. Now, he's in Galilee, and he decides to take the shortcut down through Samaria. And we've got a map here that we'll put up, and uh, you can see Samaria up at the top. And up above that is Galilee, Lake Galilee, and uh, um, that's where they were. And 
They're going to come down, straight down through Samaria, down to Jerusalem. You can see it down there. Now, most Jewish people wouldn't do this. Most Jewish people would have crossed over the Jordan River up above, come down the east side of the river, and come in at Jericho and gone up to Jerusalem. Why? Because it was unsafe for Jewish people to travel through Samaria. This is a centuries-old feud between these two tribes, the Jews and the Samaritans. It wasn't safe. So really, it's not all that surprising that Jesus and his disciples are not welcomed by this Samaritan village. That was a pretty typical response, not really surprising at all. So let me ask you a question. How do you respond when someone you love is insulted? Hmm. Michael, how do you respond when someone insults your wife? You don't like it at all. Do you hurt them? You think about it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just pointing out that when this village disrespects Jesus, that James and John response, uh, like, I get it, don't you? Because there's, you know, if you insult my wife, I will hurt you. I mean, there's that, isn't, you all know what I'm talking about, don't you? There's that thing inside you that protect, you protect the people you love. And so James and John response, very, very understandable. But do you think they overreacted just a little? Lord, would you like us to call down fire from heaven? I mean, their response is, Lord, let's just incinerate the whole stinking village. Turn them all to ash. By the way, Jesus had a nickname for James and John. Anyone know what it was? The sons of thunder. He called them the sons of thunder. And I wonder if it's because of this particular story right here. I wonder if from here on out, the boys, the rest of the guys in the gang kind of teased him. Yeah, there's the sons of thunder. They're going to incinerate anybody who opposes Jesus. Well, it's interesting because James and John totally overreact. Jesus, on the other hand, underreacts. It just says that Jesus rebuked James and John. We'll look at that rebuke in a moment. And then it says he just moved on to another village. It's kind of like, okay, they don't want us. We'll just go somewhere else. No problem. And some of the ancient Greek manuscripts have another verse that's inserted here. Uh, it's not in the oldest manuscripts, which is why it's not in your Bible. But uh, it's in many of, the older, uh, many of the manuscripts, just not the oldest ones. And here's what it says. I'm going to put it up on the screen. And he said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man came not to destroy people's lives, but to save them. This is what he said to James and John. You don't know the spirit. You're, that, I, you, that desire to incinerate people, Jesus said, that's not my spirit. That's not me. I came to save people, not destroy them. Jesus taught us, and here's where it gets really hard. This is really, really hard. Jesus taught us that we're to love our enemies, not destroy them. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28, page 885 in your Bible. You can just turn over there just a couple pages back, page 885. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. Now at the very bottom right-hand corner of the page there, love for enemies. Jesus says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Friends, this is not the only time that Jesus has said this. On a number of occasions, Jesus talked about loving their enemies. The disciples have heard this before, and yet, when someone opposes Jesus, James and John jump up and want to incinerate them. And Jesus said, that's not my spirit. You're missing the point. Jesus knew that the best way to defeat your enemy is with love. When Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, when Abraham Lincoln was criticized for being too courteous to his enemies and was reminded that it was his duty, his sworn duty, to destroy his enemies, Lincoln gave this great answer. He said, don't I destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? That's the spirit of Jesus. And in this particular case, I love this, James and John overreact, Jesus underreacts. Often the best thing you can do when faced with unreasonable opposition is simply to underreact and move on. Just underreact and move on. Now I learned this from my son Jeff. My son Jeff, when he was a teenager, knew how to push every one of my buttons. 
Do y'all know what I'm talking about? He could push my buttons. And one day, Jeff went rock climbing with some friends, and he got halfway up this rock face, and uh, the, the guy, the, the, the leader of the group who was be belaying up at, at the top there and, and uh, running the ropes, Jeff got halfway up, froze, and he looked up at Stan, and he said, I can't do it. And Stan didn't say anything. He didn't offer to help. He didn't give any advice. He didn't say anything. And after a minute, Jeff just scrambled the rest of the way up. I told that story to my friend Rick. We were in the office, and I told him that story, and Rick said, Joe, you could learn something from that. <laughs> he said, your tendency when Jeff pushes your buttons is to what? Overreact, yeah? He says, maybe you should try to underreact. Stan just underreacted, Jeff climbed right up. And you know, that became my little mantra with my son. Lena will tell you, my little mantra was underreact. I'd take a deep breath. <sighs> Underreact, just move on to the next village. Don't incinerate him. <laughs> How do you respond to opposition? Well, the disciples wanted to toast them. Jesus gave them some straight talk and said, That's not the kind of spirit that I am. Last one, number five straight talk about following. Straight talk about following. Verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So here are three would-be followers of Jesus who were not prepared to count the cost, and each of them gets some straight talk from Jesus about what it means to follow him. The first one wants to follow Jesus, offers to follow Jesus, and Jesus reminds him, he says, I have no place to lay my head. Said another way, Jesus was homeless. You know, as far as we know, Jesus, when he died, had no property at all to pass on to anyone. In fact, the only thing we know of were the clothes on his back, which were divvied up among the soldiers at the foot of the cross. Jesus was telling this man, if you choose to follow me, it may result in a loss of property. It may cost you money and things. You need to count that cost. Jesus invites a second man to follow, and he answers, well, let me first go and bury my father. Here's what you need to know. This doesn't mean that his father had just died or was even close to death. His father might be years away from death, but this man doesn't feel free to follow Jesus until he's taken care of his family obligations. And the obligation to stay and take care of the family until his father had passed away was a very real one. And Jesus' response, let the dead bury their own dead, you go and proclaim the kingdom, is not a heartless response, but it's straight talk about the cost of following. Say, listen, if you're going to follow me, I become more important. The kingdom of God becomes more important even than your family obligations. More important than property, more important than family and then the third one, a third man offers to follow Jesus, but first he wants to go and say goodbye to his family. And Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. You cannot plow a straight furrow while you're looking back. Isn't that true? If you doubt me, go home and mow your lawn and look over your shoulder while you're doing it. And you'll be all over the place, won't you? You got to look where you want to go. You've got to stay focused on what matters. You know, just a little over a week ago, uh, Lena and I celebrated our 43rd anniversary. And um, thank you. I am a blessed man. I have an incredible wife. And uh, we exchanged cards. And of course, being a pastor, I looked for a spiritual card. And let me, I don't know if you can read it, so let me just tell you the exchange here, because it's a wonderful exchange. So they're driving, and the lady says, I think we're lost. And the husband says, we're not lost. And she says, we should stop and ask for directions. Does this sound familiar, anybody? And he says, I'm not stopping and asking for directions. And then in the bottom one, it says, she says, 
dear God, give me strength. And he says, dear God, give me patience. <laughs> and when you open it up inside, it says, it's true, the couple who prays together stays together. <laughs> so the day we were celebrating our anniversary, we were on our way to run do a couple fun things together. And as we're driving, I am looking over to the side, there's a big construction project going on not far from our house, and I'm looking at this construction project, and I looked a little too long, and when I looked back, the car in front of me had stopped. And I jammed on my brakes and swerved, and I just barely missed them. My heart was racing, and I turned over to Elena and said, that would have ruined the anniversary celebration. When you're driving, it's a good idea to look where you are going, right? And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, if you're going to follow me, you want to keep your eyes on where you're going and where Jesus is leading. You keep your eyes focused ahead, not looking back. Don't be distracted by other things. So here are three things. Three things that often um, we fail to count the cost. Property, family, and distractions. Three things that can keep us from following Jesus. So let me give you some real straight talk about following Jesus. Ready? Here it comes. It will cost you, to follow Jesus will cost you everything. It will cost you everything. And here's the other side of that equation. Following Jesus will also give you everything. Life with a capital L. So does it cost you everything? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Let's pray. My prayer today, Lord, is that you would speak to each one of us. That every one of us will leave here today with something from God, some word of encouragement, some direction, something you want us to know or do. Speak to each one of us. And then, Lord, help us go out this week, take what you've said and put it into practice and make a difference in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.